Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? Turn your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians, chapter 3. Seems it's about to be wedding season at Lawrence Chapel. We've got several young couples about to, to embark on the path of holy matrimony. Uh, so I thought this would be a good time to talk about marriage. Unfortunately, all of them are not here today, but uh, hopefully by tomorrow, uh, this sermon will be up on our YouTube channel. So if you think there's something worthwhile that would help somebody else to listen to, you can point them in that direction. Sadly, not every marriage lasts till death do us part. And this morning, we're going to look at some advice from Scripture that maybe will help that to happen. Uh, I used to be an expert on marriage. In fact, I've, I've been to marriage classes. I've taught college class on marriage. And then I got married. So now I'm not such an expert anymore on, on marriages. But I do know that what God tells you in Scripture is good. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3. We'll start reading in verse 12. It says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, longsuffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as if is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Sunday school teacher asked her class if they knew any scriptures about marriage. And one little boy, hand shot up. He said, I do, I do. She said, what is it? He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. <laughs> Did you know what you're doing when you got married? Did you have it all figured out? Did you know that this is what you're supposed to do? Uh, very few people do. Usually we go into marriage or blind, uh, clueless, but we don't have to be clueless because God gave us some suggestions. He gave us some answers. There's something wrong with the home today. Uh, back in 1870, there was one divorce for every 34 marriages. 30 years later, by 1900, there was one divorce in every five marriages. By 1950, it was one in three. And statistics today say that when there are two marriages, one of them probably won't make it. Uh, about half of all marriages end in divorce. Statistics say 38% of all first marriages end in divorce. 79% of those folks get married again, and 44% of second marriages end in divorce. 30% of all American married couples experience some form of domestic violence. 20% of all police officers who die in the line of duty are responding uh, to family fights. Approximately 12 to 15 million wives are battered each year in the United States. The Census Bureau tells us that one in every four American families with children is a single parent home. And over 80% of those single parent homes are led by, by mothers. When I perform a wedding ceremony, I always mention that God only established two institutions, the church and the home. The home is God ordained and in the very first institution that he established on earth goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two, verse 18. The Lord said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stood thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Leave, cleave, and be one. That was God's plan for marriage. And marriage is the foundation upon which the home is supposed to be established. But Paul told Timothy that <coughs> problems would arise. Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1, Paul pointed out some problems. He said, For this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul told Timothy in latter days there are going to be problems. Families are going to fall apart. Homes are not going to be what they need to be. Centuries before that even, Confucius said, the strength of a nation is derived from the integrity of its homes. One of the greatest things that we can do for our country is to have Christian homes. One of the greatest things we can do for the church is to have Christian homes. And in the text that we open with in Colossians 3, Paul gives us some very practical ideas, some very practical suggestions for having the best relationship in our lives. See, people present problems for all of us. The hard part of having a relationship is you have to do it with people. And people don't always act the way they're supposed to act, say the things they're supposed to say, do the things we're supposed to do. But Paul's saying it shouldn't be that way for husbands and wives. So let's look at Paul's instructions for husbands and wives. But before we start that, it's good to understand the historical background. See, when Jesus came to earth, uh, women weren't equal to their husbands. Men and women weren't the same. And according to Jewish law, uh, the woman was the man's possession. If he married somebody, then she belonged to him, like his house or his cattle or whatever. The woman belonged to the man. For instance, under Jewish law, the man could write a bill of divorcement and get a divorce from a woman for any reason. The wives didn't have any standing under the law. They couldn't get tired of their husband and say, I want a divorce. In fact, there were only three grounds where a woman could get a divorce from her husband under Jewish law. If he got leprosy, if he denied the faith, or if he ravished a virgin. Those are the only three things that a woman could get a divorce for. And the Greeks weren't any better. In fact, the Greeks were probably worse. In Greek society, a respectable wife lived in separate quarters in the house. She didn't stay in the same room with the husband. They didn't eat meals together. Uh, the wives had no standing at all. They couldn't go marketing uh, with the men. They didn't join their men folk for anything. They were servants. They were supposed to maintain complete chastity, total devotion for the husband, but the husband could go anywhere he wanted, do anything he wanted, have as many uh, liaisons as he wanted without any guilt at all. That was okay according to their law. And then Jesus came and he said, there is no male and female. There are no bond and free. Everybody is the same in Christ. And so when Christianity was taught, women got a different status for the very first time. And so then Paul gives his guidelines for marriage Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Maybe Paul addressed the women first because for the first time they were on equal standing. Don't know exactly, but he's telling them just because you've been made equal, just because you're not property anymore, just because you don't belong to the husband doesn't mean that you're supposed to try to run everything. You're still supposed to submit. Now, for you to understand what submit means, if you look up the word submission, uh, as it's found in Scripture, it doesn't mean slavery, it doesn't mean subjugation, it doesn't mean inferiority. Submission 
uh, is to arrange oneself under a delegated authority. God's just pointing out the order things are supposed to be. Uh, submission doesn't mean you're inferior. If you've ever been in the military, uh, probably most soldiers would tell you that the sergeant is smarter, he may be stronger, he may be a better moral person than the second lieutenant that is his commanding officer, and yet he has to submit to those orders because that's where he falls. In the military, it's called chain of command, and it would be a really big mess if people didn't follow the chain of command. God didn't say, women, you are to be servants to the men. He just said, here's the chain of command. God, then Jesus, then man, then the woman. But you're all working for the same thing. You're all working together. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, Paul writes, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God. Submission. 1 Corinthians 14, 40 said, let everything be done decently and in order. This is not a, I get to be your boss. This is, here is where we fall in order of responsibility. My responsibility is to love you. Your responsibility is to be in submission to me. That doesn't mean we're supposed to be, the wife is supposed to be under the husband's thumb. That doesn't mean that you've got to serve him. It means you're supposed to submit to the husband. And notice that submission is the wife's responsibility. There's nowhere in Scripture where the Bible says, Husbands, make your wife be submissive. Husbands, beat your wife till she does what you say you're supposed to do. If there's a woman that's not a submissive wife, that's between her and God. That's not my responsibility as husband. My responsibility, my duty, what I was assigned by Christ is love my wife. Think about it. I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church. What woman wouldn't want to submit herself to somebody that was willing to die for her, was willing to give everything he had for her, to live his entire life for her? So the husband's duty is to love the wife. The woman's duty is to submit to the husband. That doesn't mean that she's inferior. You're supposed to honor the wife as the weaker vessel. Weaker vessels are more precious. They're more delicate. They're supposed to get special honor. But why? Why is the wife to submit to the husband? Well, go back to Ephesians 5.21. Uh, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in fear of God. So the husband's supposed to submit to the wife. The wife's supposed to submit to the husband. Uh, we're supposed to give in. Several years ago, I saw a survey. Uh, there was one question asked. There were all these different couples. Some of them were happily married. Some of them were not so happily married. Some of them were really struggling. Some were with some in between. They ask them one question. In your relationship, who gives the most? In your relationship, who gives the most? And the unhappy couples, the couples where they weren't getting along at all, both the husband and the wife said, I do. I give in the most. I surrender the most. I do the most. In couples that were getting along okay, one person would say, I give the most, and the other person would agree, said, yeah, you give the most happiest couples and they were asked who gives the most in your relationship both of them said he does or she does both of them thought that the other person was doing more was bringing more to the relationship than I than the other one was I saw this example a lot of people think marriage is a 50 50 relationship I do my half you do your half and we got it everything works together and that would work out great but what if you think is your 50%? I don't think is 50%. What if I think your 50% is only 45? And you think my 50% is only 30? And we both think we're doing our half, but there's something in the middle. It's not being met. It's not getting done. Somebody said marriage is a 100-100 relationship. I give everything I can. You give everything you can. And all this space in the middle is gravy. This is where we've got blessings where we accumulate. Then if I don't quite give everything, and you don't quite give everything, we still are doing well. We've still got things going well because we're both doing everything we can to make our relationship be what it's supposed to be. A wise person once said that marriages begin with the wife thinking, he's not good now, but I'm going to fix him once we get married. And the husband thinking, this sweet, beautiful little woman's always going to be just like she is. And they both end up disappointed. 
We need to bring everything we can to the marriage. We need to be doing what we can for the other one and not expecting what the other person can do for us. Submission is not giving in. Submission is doing what we can to help. I saw an article where a man called the Social Security office. He wanted to find out what his benefits would be after he retired. So they told him how long he'd worked, what he would make, what he could expect each month. And then he said, uh, how about my wife? What will she get? He said, well, has she ever worked? He said, she's worked every day of her life making me happy. He said, well, that, that's, that's not what I mean. Has she ever worked under Social Security? And he said, when we got married, we agreed I'd make the living. She'd make living worthwhile. Okay. Now, in today's situation, it's very rare that we have a stay-at-home wife and mother. Usually both individuals are working, but we got to make sure that we don't get so caught up in making a living that we forget to make a life. We don't get so caught up in making a dollar that we forget to make living together worthwhile. Uh, saw this illustration, use it quite often. There's the husband, there's the wife, but God is supposed to be in every relationship. And if you think of your family, if you think of your marriage as a triangle with the husband and the wife and God at the head of the marriage, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. That's God's plan. He wants us to do His will. He wants us to be submissive one to another. The closer we are to His plan, the better our family will be, the better our marriage will be. So the wife is supposed to be submissive. Why? Well, let's look at the rest of Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Other translations say, uh, that's what God has planned for you. That's your role. That's your responsibility. That's your job. It's not a current event. It's not a recent revelation. That's how God established man and woman in the Garden of Eden. It's His design. It's His plan for the family. So that's the wife's duty. What's the husband's duty? Colossians 3.19 Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Uh, there's a parallel scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's also talking to husbands. In verse 25 he says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So the message is, husbands, love your wives. How? The way Jesus loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He gave his life for it. He devoted his life to the church. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Can any of you imagine Jesus being bitter towards the church? Jesus going to the cross and saying, I'm doing this because of you people. This is all your fault. You caused this. We did. But that wasn't his attitude. Jesus went to the cross asking God to forgive the people that were nailing him on the cross. It was love that kept Jesus on the cross. And marriage is supposed to be a picture of Jesus and the church. The church living according to his will. Jesus willing to die to protect the church. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. We're supposed to serve him because he loved us. He died for us. I saw a story that kind of illustrates where our society is today. A man noticed his wife was depressed, she was moody, she was sad. And so he did what any self-righteous or current man in society would do today. He made her an appointment with a psychiatrist. So they went for couples therapy and the woman and the husband showed up and the psychiatrist listened to all their problems. He listened to all their issues. He said, I know what the problem is. He told the woman, stand up. He held her by the hands. He looked at her. He says, now, watch this. And he took her in his arms and gave her a big hug. And they said, you could just see the tension melting. And she just got soft. And she just relaxed because that's what she needed. She needed somebody to pat her on the back, to tell her it was OK, to give her a big hug. And the psychiatrist looked at the husband and says, now, you just do this. That's all she needs. Make sure she gets this. And the husband said, 
I can bring her in on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I play golf three days a week. It's not about getting somebody else to do your job. It's about you doing your job as a husband. You're supposed to love your wife. You're supposed to support her. You're supposed to hold her and tell her it's all going to be okay. That's your role. You're supposed to provide for your wife the way Jesus loved the church. Irma Bombeck used to write an article in the paper. She's passed on now. But somebody asked her in an interview one time what her most precious possession was. She thought about it for a minute and then she said, I guess it's probably my wedding ring. Because every time I look at it, I can think I've got somebody that loves me. That's what marriage is supposed to be about. Every time we think about it, we think we've got somebody that loves us. So what does it mean to love your wife? Well, the rest of Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. How can we avoid bitterness? How can we avoid harshness? How can we avoid the things that Paul says we shouldn't have? When you think of love in the Bible, what do you think of? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Start reading with me in verse 4. And I'm reading from the New American Standard today because it doesn't say charity, it says love. But look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. Love does not brag. It's not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It's not provoked. It does not keep an account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Which one of those descriptions of love was a feeling? It didn't say how it feels to be in love. It says, if you love, here's what you do. Those were all action words. Those are things you do or that you don't do if you love somebody. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of homes break up because the feelings are not there anymore. Maybe those feelings would be there if those actions were there. If we were still doing the things we're supposed to be doing, Maybe we'd still be feeling the things that we want to feel. I had a friend tell me a long time ago, it's easier to act your way to feeling better than it is to feel your way to acting better because if I wait till I feel like it, it might not ever get done. But we're supposed to love, we're supposed to uh, believe, we're supposed to hope, we're supposed to endure, we're supposed to do all those things because that's what love is all about. Uh, those of you that are about to say, I do, need to remember that the only uh, way that this marriage can ever end honorably is one of you standing next to the other one's casket. Marriage is supposed to be until death do us part. And if we'll follow those guidelines, if we'll love people the way that God says we're supposed to love people, wives, if you'll submit to your husbands, husbands, if you'll love your wife, uh, you won't have those problems. Robert Sternberg is a psychologist Yale University is not a religious man, but he wrote this. While passion is the first to flower, it's also the first to fade. Intimacy and commitment are slower to develop, but far more matter in making a marriage last. You have to work constantly at rejuvenating a relationship. You can't just count on it being okay, or it will tend toward a hollow commitment. People need to put the kind of energy into a marriage that they put into their career. You may have seen it, I've seen it several times lately. Somebody said that marriage license is just a piece of paper. Somebody else said, yes, so's a paycheck, but you still get up every morning and go out to work for it. Another person said, marriage license is just a piece of paper. And somebody else said, yes, so's money, but you don't see anybody throwing dollar bills in the trash can. Work for it, strive for it, try to do it the way that God wants you to do it. This lesson hadn't been about being a Christian. It's about living a way that we can be what, we're, what God wants us to be. But the only way that one can become part of the Lord's church, the, one, the only way that you can become part of the bride of Christ is to obey the gospel. I recently read a story about a woman named Ruth Anna Metzger. And I Googled her. I tried to find out she is a real person. Don't know if this story really happened, but it illustrates the point. Ruthanna Metzger is a professional singer uh, in Seattle. 
and she was hired by a multimillionaire to sing at his wedding. And it was an elaborate event, and she was really looking forward to it. What she was really looking forward to was the reception, because after the wedding, after her performance, they were all going to meet at uh, the Columbia Tower, Seattle's tallest building, and the reception took up the whole top two floors. And so she was excited about the night. The wedding came. She did her performance. They went to the reception. They rode the elevator up to the next to the top floor, and there was this elaborate receiving area. And the bride and the groom walked up to the stairs. They cut a ceremonial ribbon. They walked up the stairs to the top floor. And then all the guests followed them up to the top of the steps. At the top of the stairs, there was a maitre d' with a big bound book. And he was telling everybody where they were supposed to be seated. He opened the book and said, what's your name? And she said, Ruth Anna Metzger. And this is my husband, Roy. And he looked down the list and he said, uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're not on the list. And she said, oh, I'm Ruth Anna Metzger. Uh, I'm the singer. I sang at the wedding. And he looked at it and he said, I'm sorry, you're not on the list. And she said, but, but I was the singer. And he said, man, I don't care who you are or what you did. If you're not on this list, you can't go to this band. And he called a waiter and they put her and her husband on the elevator and sent her back down. They could see from the top of the stairs into the reception room. They saw all the elaborate food and drink and everything that was laid out, and they could see what they were missing, but they couldn't get there because their name wasn't on the list. On the way down in the elevator, her husband said, what happened? And she said, I forgot to send in the RSVP. We got the invitation in the mail, but I was so busy that I didn't send it in, and I thought, well, I'm the singer. Surely they'll let me into the reception. And she started crying, partly because she missed this elaborate banquet, but partly because she realized that this was kind of a small example of what heaven was going to be like. Uh, because it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done, if your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're not going to get into the banquet. You need to be a Christian. The only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. The Lord's invitation is always extended. We all have an opportunity, as long as we're breathing, to accept that invitation. But we've got to send in the RSVP. He tells us what to do if we want to accept His invitation. We've got to believe that He's God's Son. We've got to repent of our past life of sin. We've got to confess Jesus as the Lord of our life. We've got to allow ourselves to be buried in a watery grave of baptism rise up to a new life. There's nothing else that will satisfy. Doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Is your name in the book of life? If it's not, it can be. Won't you come forward right now? We stand together and as we sing.